Hey traders, David Frost, My Strategic Forecast, here for another episode of Common Sense Market Analysis. Today is Wednesday, June 16, 2021. We're looking at a daily chart of the SPY or Spider, which is the proxy for the S&P 500. What do we have on the docket today? Well, we had Kabuki Theater. The market did move around Kabuki Theater. Again, that's the FOMC announcement and then the press conference following the announcement by the Fed Chair, Jerome Powell. So they had all that stuff. It's now in the rearview mirror. So let's pick apart the markets and see what happened. So from a daily chart perspective, we just want to look at the chart. We want to make the assessment from a 30,000 foot view. Did anything happen today? Again, with the daily chart, we don't even care that there was a Fed announcement. We don't care about what the news was. All we're looking at is the chart. Let's just say, for argument's sake, we came in at 4 o'clock, we looked at the chart, we had no idea what happened all day long, and we said, did anything change? That's basically the way I try and look at the daily chart. And what I would say today is, eh, in a big picture scheme, nothing really changed, but they did run a test of the 20 period moving average. However, staying above all the moving averages, the trend is still up. The trend is the dominant thing. Therefore, nothing really happened from a big picture perspective on the daily chart. Now, I'm obviously going to take it nine steps further. However, Still on the daily chart, I'm also going to take a look at something that some of you may see, some of you may not see. So I'm seeing a potential gap, but it looks like that gap was filled. So that's interesting. Now let me look at the numbers. 418.77 is the gap. The next day's low is 418.84. That means technically it's an open gap. Okay, fair enough. Because we want to be a market proctologist and we want to look deeper into things, 418.77 was that number. Now let's go down to a different chart and see what we find. And by the way, incidentally, you'll note when we go inside the numbers that that was one of the numbers that was put on the board where the market may run a test of or pay a visit to as an extreme from when it was a lot higher, knowing that the Fed could disjoint the market. So we have to look at extremes. Where would they go on the downside? Where could they go on the upside? And this general area within pennies was one of the numbers. Now, here's an hourly chart. You see there was an open gap down here. There's a 200 period moving average on the hourly chart down here. They didn't get down there, but that was a spot. You have a big breakup candle, therefore, you have the low of a breakup candle down around 417 and a quarter. So that, in that general neighborhood, was another spot. So just to wrap things up on the daily chart conversation and the conversation around Kabuki Theater, there's tomorrow. And what does that mean? It means sometimes, not every time, not even a lot of the times, but sometimes what you'll get is a market that does one thing after the Fed. And what did it do after the Fed? Well, what it really did was, even though the market went down, It found a low and had a big rally, which sends a message to the market that the Fed is there, the Fed put is there, the Fed is going to be there to save the day, the Fed is going to continue adding liquidity to the market, therefore don't fight the Fed. That's fine. However, there's always the next day. So the next day, somehow, some way, for some reason, maybe the market is now going down. You wake up to a gap down or the market goes down tomorrow. What they'll do, and they being the media, what they'll do is they'll assign the same reason that was present today for tomorrow's decline. What they'll do is they'll reinterpret the Fed's information. They'll reinterpret it so that their news story fits the direction of the market. That's just the way it works. It's the same one as you have an earnings report, your long Apple. All of a sudden, Apple keeps going up right after the earnings, and then it turns around mysteriously and starts headed down. And what they said is the numbers were great, and that's why the stock is going up. Ten minutes later, when the stock reversed, what they say is, well, everybody was pouring through the numbers and pouring through the report, and what they found was. That also implies that all of a sudden, a bunch of people sat down with the earnings report That's who knows how many pages, right? It's probably hundreds of pages. They sat down with the report next to their computer, right? The trading platform open, and they're 
buying or selling Apple as they're reading the report. It's the most horrific bunch of nonsense you ever heard, but you've been hearing that on TV ever since the beginning of time. Now that they've poured through the report, it just changed direction so they need a new story. Same thing applies if the market was going to go down tomorrow, they would reinterpret a lot of the information that they wanted to take as positive after the Fed press conference today. We also have the market is looking, when it's in bullish mode, it climbs the wall of worry. It's looking for reasons to go higher. One would say, yeah, but we have X, Y, and Z, A, B, and C. We have 572 reasons till Sunday why things are terrible, why the market should be falling apart, and the reality is the market doesn't care. Nobody cares about that stuff until they care. When do they care? They care when the market goes down and they're losing money. When they're making money, nobody cares. What do I mean by that? I mean this. Let's say you ran into a neighbor outside. The neighbor has an investment account. He has a 401k. He or she. I want to be politically correct. He, she, it, they, whatever. So they have an investment account. And frankly, they really have no idea. They're not in tune with the daily operations of the market. They're just long-term investors. They go about their daily business. This isn't their business. This is my business. This is many of your businesses. But let's just say the average person who has an investment account, 401k, they just don't understand, nor do they care what goes on each and every day. They know that their account's been going up. That's really all they care about. Let's say you run into them walking the dogs, and you start telling them about all the reasons why the market should be going down. Do you think they want to hear about that? No, they don't care. A, they don't know what you're talking about. B, you're being Debbie Downer. You're telling them that all the money that they've just made is going to go away unless they sell everything, and you're putting fear, uncertainty, and doubt, the FUD factor, in their mind. They don't like that. So under normal garden variety conditions, the average person's psyche is going to block them from hearing what you're talking about. Stay with me, there's a method to the madness. The reason I'm bringing all this up is because I know a lot of you are in that camp that feel like the market should be collapsing. I get all that, but that's not the way it works. The market, A, will run out of time. When it runs out of time, there will likely be a coinciding or corresponding event. And if there's not, they'll find one the following day. It will put in a sign or signal of a trend change and until it does, the market is in climb the wall of worry mode, the trend is your friend, until she throws you out the third story window. What about inside the numbers? Even though it was very quiet leading up to the Fed, we can still learn something from the commentary inside the numbers. Plus, we can learn something from the numbers that were posted on the board right before Kabuki Theater began. So nothing's going to happen leading up to the Fed. We know all that. In the early thoughts, we're talking about post-Kabuki represents an opportunity to break out if they so choose. Now, they could have had a jam session into the close today. That intraday reversal after the Fed during the press conference, whenever it took place, that was really part of the recipe for that end-of-the-day jam session where they could have just bought them up right into the closing bell. You don't know that they're going to do it, and what you'll see later in the notes is we had a number on the board that they had to get above, stay above, and if they started closing candles above that number, that was really the final recipe or the final ingredient for that jam session. They didn't really do that, and so therefore they actually dripped into the closing bell. We also have to have the awareness that at some point a sharp fall is the awareness that will eventually happen. We don't guess at it or anticipate it. We're aware of it with the knowledge to act upon it. So we're looking for the signs and signal of the reversal. I keep saying that. Where do you find that? What does it look like? It's found in the course Lazy E-Mini Trader. And so what happens is things begin on a short-term chart and then they morph onto longer-term charts or larger charts. And that's the way we have to do it. The market's going to let us know on a short-term time frame first. And if it begins confirming on subsequent time frames, that's where we actually get 
puzzle piece after puzzle piece after puzzle piece that allows us to put together the picture of what's likely to happen next. Let's see what else we've got as the day gets underway. We had some numbers on the board. Four and a quarter, 46 is the current top or overhead resistance. That was yesterday's high. 423, give or take, is the lower portion of the current range. Just so you get the visual, here's the five-minute SPY right at the vertical today's activity. And 423, while it was the lower portion of the range, they didn't get there until the afternoon before the Fed announcement. What they did was they actually ate time off the clock over it. What does that tell you? It's making a bearish pattern. Again, after the Fed, anything goes, so you kind of throw the charts out the window for a while because you can get that EKG thing going around the Fed. Market goes up, market goes down. So all the patterns that were forming the prior hour or two or three or whatever it was, they really can get disjointed around the Fed announcement. That's why I like to call it Kabuki Theater. Well, it's not the only reason why, but it's one of the reasons why. Anyway, later on, they should get moving, and they did get moving. So we'll scroll up. You can pause the video and certainly read the stuff and go back to the charts and double check the work. I urge you to do that. 945, 423.70, give or take, will be support if tested. Closing candles below could be trouble for the bulls. That's at 945. Again, with the visual, what happened? They closed below 423.70, and that's where they ate time off the clock underneath it. Pretty interesting. Now, the problem with a day like today is you can't take a position in front of the Fed. They're not doing anything normally before the Fed. And if they do something before the Fed, you don't know which way they're going to go. And you can't count on it. And you don't want to get stuck in a position leading up to the Fed. At least not if you're treating it as a business. Let's see what else we've got as the day moves along. Nothing was happening, so I said, we'll come back in the afternoon. They dripped lower ahead of the Fed announcement. Again, you can't trade for that. But at 1.30, before the whole thing gets underway, let's get some extremes on the board. If they go up, new highs, we know about that stuff. Not a lot anybody can do about that. However, if they drop them, there's a couple of spots that would produce a reaction under normal garden variety conditions. So I put them up on the board. They didn't get there, but wait, there's more. And just in case for traders that were willing to participate if they got down to those level, much below that and the selling is for real. So running a test is one thing. Getting below 41785, that would have been something different. No idea whether they were going to get there. However, if they do, I'm likely taking a long side trade. Let's see what else we have. Now, 147, right before the Fed. 41980 is another spot. Here's the hourly chart, and you see in two consecutive hours, they ran a test down there, but they never got to my number. You see in the 202 post, 419.92 against 419.80. Big bounce, still anything goes between now and the press conference. That was what was going on. That was Kabuki Theater. Very difficult to trade. Frankly, many times more enjoyable to watch. Moving along, see what else we've got. As the press conference is going on, they're looking for any excuse or reason to continue going higher, a la the bounce off the lows. A recapture of 423.15 on candle closes, and they can take another leg higher. If that begins to happen, it could be the recipe for an end-of-day jam session. Even though there was little time left in the day, it became apparent to me that 423.15 was really an important spot. Another number down here, 421.60, has the bulls in control, but if they can get above 423.15, another leg higher coming. So you see, repeat. Another repeat. Keep repeating. It was that important. Now we're looking at a 10-minute chart, and you see here on the right-hand side, 423.15. They made a run for it. They tried to get above. They closed one 10-minute candle above, and that was it. They couldn't do another. They couldn't do a 15. They couldn't do anything else, and therefore, they fell away into the end of the day. But that was the ticket. That was the spot. They needed to get above there and stay above there in order to have another leg higher and a potential jam session run them into the closing bell. They couldn't do it. And then you can see we go into the end of the day and certainly when you run out of time on the clock, what happens into the end of the day is an anything goes scenario. What about stocks on the move? Did we have anything going over there today? And the answer is yes, we did. We had the first two of 
five on the list hit their price, target, or entry objectives. HRB and Oracle, O-R-C-L. The others didn't get to their numbers, they're off the board. Now, HRB is the first one we're going to go over, and it looks like it blew through the first number and went to the second and then went back up. That's the look from this chart, but that's not really what happened. What really happened was it came in the second minute of the day and pulled up one penny short. The low was 23.63, and it rallied away. When that happens, and you know the way I am, I like to paint by the numbers, I don't want that number anymore. Sometimes they work. And sometimes they don't, but my experience is more often than not they don't, but it reduces the odds of the initial number working to the tune or to the magnitude that most of them work. So when I take these out of the equation, this is where I come up with the high percentage of wins. What I mean by that is they either come in my way or it's the highway. So if you think about this and paint by the numbers, what happened? Now what happened was... The second number was activated. The second number worked. Where did they go? They went back to the first number. So now what do I say? The numbers work. Just from a conceptual standpoint, the stock found support in the zone that we identified in the pre-market, period. By the way, here's a daily chart, and you're looking at the second number. Don't we discuss this all the time? Isn't this considered where the stock actually broke out from? It rallied up to that point, and it couldn't get through. It pulled back, and it finally got through. So what did it do now? It rallied up and came back to test what? A former breakout area. How many days in a row do we discuss this? Every day in a row. We show it a multitude of different ways. Here is one way where one of the numbers that I picked out from Stocks on the Move was exactly for that reason. People ask me all the time, where do you come up with the numbers? And I say, it's everything that I teach in the course. I use it using all charts, using everything under the sun that I can find, but it's everything that I teach in the course. How about Oracle 7663 was on the board bright and early, and it worked, it was support, it didn't give you a rocket ride, but it gave you a base hit. Gave you a little more than a base hit. What do base hits do? Base hits put you in the Hall of Fame. What's going on over in Camp IWM? What's jumping off the page? And I know everybody sees it because they came in to at least make an attempt at a test of that trend line. And you see what's happening with the 20-period moving average as well. It's meeting the trend line. It will soon be on the trend line. So we don't know whether or not they're going to bust through that trend line and close below it or not. But what we do know is that under normal garden variety conditions, they will come back to that trend line to run a test. Now, is the trend line the same as it was, for example, Wednesday morning? And the answer is no, it's not. And what I'm saying is it's not the same type of support that it was before they ran a test and came up short. The low of day today is awfully close to that trend line. We're going to call that running a test. They didn't spike it. They didn't touch it but they certainly ran a test. What about the folks down at the transportation department? So this is interesting. So this is my favorite canary in the coal mine. Let's just cut to the chase. It's melting away. The bearish pattern that's been eating time off the clock underneath the 50 period moving average is melting away. This general area, 14,920 or so, is really the next spot of support, but they've been hovering over it for several days. So it increasingly becomes less likely to hold price up. The point here is we have a down day again in the transports. Not that every day has been down, but they haven't been able to recapture those moving averages. That means that the trend is changing on the transports. And here's another image of the 240 chart, same routine. You can see them below three moving averages on this chart. This is why we have to look around the horn at a lot of different things. Just because the S&P 500 was rescued midday, that other stuff isn't developing underneath the hood. Anything going on with the Silicon Valley people? Not really. They had a little dipsy doodle like the other markets. They recovered. They're above all the moving averages, around the highs. There's not much you can say here. There's really nothing definitive on the chart. Either 
they're going to continue pushing higher or they'll fail, but you don't know that they're going to fail until they really get below around 330. XLF and the financials we know are sensitive to the Fed, that whole thing. We discussed it a couple of times. So from a daily chart perspective, what we see here is a test of the 50 period moving average, nothing more, nothing less. They ended up down 10 cents and we can't really make heads or tails out of that one. And we've done this before, you'll find this interesting. So the daily chart, we just looked at them running a test of the 50 and at the same time they were doing that, it was the 100 on the 240 chart it was the 200 period moving average on the 120 minute chart. We'll call that a trifecta. And I think we did that the other day and I can't remember what vehicle it was we did it with, what stock it was. But when you see something like that, the odds increase, we're getting a stack, whether it's a full stack, a half stack, a three quarter stack, the more stack, the more items you get to stack on top of each other. And when you get three moving averages all hitting at the same time on different charts, what are the odds that price is going to blow through all those all at the same time, or they're going to bounce off that convergence of moving averages? And using the 80-20 rule, the majority of time, you're going to get a bounce off the moving averages. Sometimes they'll blow through it, but this is the risk business, and when you have those kind of percentages in your favor... Sometimes you just have to take on the risk. Now, I didn't even see this when it was occurring. I saw it now when I brought up the charts. I have another screen where I look at a whole host of charts, so I see everything out of the corner of my eye all at the same time. Smash mouth. Down a little bit at the end of the day, but just like the cues, again, we can't say anything other than above all the moving averages, they're pushing on challenging the highs, but they're not at highs, so we'll see. It still could be the lower high scenario, but we won't know unless they begin to break below the moving averages. That's the way this one's going to work. And have I told you how much I appreciate each and every one of you? Without you, these videos are not possible. That is true and accurate information. We're going to pull the ripcord here today. I'm David Frost, My Strategic Forecast. Thanks again for tuning in to another episode of Common Sense Market Analysis.